Uh, yes, so this is a joint work with uh, Andras uh, uh, Vikram and Meiraf. Uh, Andras and Meiraf are here. Uh, yeah, so I will talk to you about spotting trees with few leaves. I will try to tell you the good news that this is easier than for trees with many leaves. This may be not that surprising at this season of the year, at least in Poland. Uh, yeah. Easier yeah. than many leaves, you said? Yes. Okay. So, uh, but actually we work on several problems, so let me introduce the problems first. The first one needs really no introduction, the Hamiltonian cycle. Uh, but the important thing is that we focus on undirected graphs, okay? And this applies to all, all the problems I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's close relative, it's Hamiltonian path. So we just look for a path. And then you can generalize it further by introducing a parameter, k, and then you ask whether there is a k vertex path in the graph. And this problem you can parameter, uh, you can generalize even further. So you can consider a path as a tree uh, on k vertices with exactly two leaves, yes? So now what if you ask, what we, if you have two integers in your input, kl, and you ask for a tree on k vertices uh, which include exactly l leaves? This is KL3 problem. And the final problem uh, we consider is called K internal spanning tree. So this is a generalization of spanning tree, I mean, optimization version of spanning tree. You look for a spanning tree with at least K internal vertices. All right? And uh, this problem I would like to s uh, stay a little bit longer because uh, it has several equivalent formulations and some of them will be more useful for me. So first observation is that you don't really need this adjective spanning here, okay? Why is that? Because if you find uh, any tree with at least k internal vertices, which is not necessarily spanning, then you can just take any vertex uh, outside of it and connect it to the tree and your number of internal vertices cannot drop, right? Uh, second observation, maybe less obvious, is that uh, you can focus on some special kinds of trees, namely, namely the trees in which uh, when you consider edges from leaves to their parents, these edges form a matching. Yes, why is that? If you have uh, two leaves uh, with a common parent, if you re remove one of them, then your number of internal vertices does not uh, change. So. So you can, foc you can focus on finding only such uh, trees and you don't lose anything. And if this is the case, then you know that in, in your trees that the number of leaves is at most the number of internal vertices, right? So uh, now it means that it is equivalent to find a k plus l comma l3 for some l number of leaves between 2 and k. Yes, so in a way I reduced this problem to the problem of KL3. So once you find, have a fast algorithm for KL3, you have some algorithm for this problem. I will use it at some point. All right, so these are all the problems. You know that they are NP-complete, yeah, because they generalize Hamiltonian path. You know that Hamiltonian path is NP-complete. Uh, and uh, we are interested uh, in FPT algorithms for the parameterized problems. Uh, they will be all of the form C to the K, and we are interested in getting C small. And for non-parameterized problems, uh, we are interested in exponential time algorithms. So, I mean, or we parameterize them by N, yes, and we also want C to be small. All right, so uh, it's a bit of history. So for Hamiltonian cycle, there was a big surprise in 2010. It turned out, uh, thanks to Andreas, uh, that uh, it can be done below to do the N. Uh, for KPAF, there is also some amazing history of uh, improvements. And the current state of art is that actually you can transform transfer some of the, uh, the key tricks of this uh, approach to k path even, and you get 1.66 to the k. So this is due to 
Andreas, Tore, Petteri, and Miko. All of them are here, I believe. Uh, all right, KL3 is not that uh, was not that popular. Uh, the best algorithm so far is two to the k polyspace. And K internal spanning tree, a lot, uh, again, a lot of results. And uh, uh, in polyspace, you can get currently 4 to the K in exponential space slightly f faster. Uh, and finally, for this problem, uh, I want to list also exponential time algorithms. Yes, and here, unfortunately, you, get, you have only 2 to the N. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is already non-trivial. Yeah? This is not, in many of graph problems, 2 to the n is trivial, uh, or some simple dynamic programming, this is slightly uh, less trivial. Uh, so there is a natural open problem of breaking this 2 to the n barrier. Yes, and uh, uh, authors of this paper, when they uh, sent a journal version, they already observed this. Uh, uh, result and it was they they they, they pose an open problem. Well, this is possible, uh, like to, to break this two to the n barrier by uh, somehow transferring these tricks, this approach, uh, this algebraic approach of Bjorklund, from uh, finding paths to finding trees. Yes. And uh, I think our main result is that yes, we can. Yes. So what we do is we. Uh, generalize uh, this algorithm to finding KL trees, uh, and it runs it in in this time. Yes. So it means if your L is constant, then you get exactly the same running time. So, so in particular for L equal two, you get the same running time. Uh, when your L is small, then you still beat two to the K, which was the previous best algorithm for this. Yes. So that's why. The title is finding trees with, spotting trees with few leaves. And it has some further consequences. So as I, st as I told you, immediately we'll get some algorithm for k internal spanning tree. So this is this. This already is something interesting, because in this, all, all of this works in polynomial space. Yes. Uh, uh, so before, there was not that fast algorithm in polynomial space. But actually, by some cute trick, you can uh, apply this routine even smarter. Uh, so wh when you get this uh, nasty time, when, when, when in your solution uh, you have a lot of leaves. Yes, when you have, you are looking for internal spanning tree with k uh, internal vertices, and if in your solution you have also k leaves, then you have this time. If you have much less leaves, then you can like s stop your uh, stop this loop earlier and you, you run faster. Yes? So this is the worst case. But if you know you have a lot of leaves, then as I, as I told you, you know that in the solution there is this big matching from leaves to their parents. And uh, actually, I haven't told you that, but you can also s s uh, see that you can focus on trees when you, when, you, when you shave off this matching, what remains is still connected. So this is a tree. Yes? So now, what can you do? Assume that somebody magically gives you a partition of the vertex set into green vertices and red vertices such that you are guaranteed that in the green part you've got this matching of the solution you're looking for, and in the red part you've got the, the remaining tree. Yes? So then uh, you just look for a tree here using this algorithm, and this runs much faster because uh, uh, because the tree is small, yes, so the parameters k and l are small. And once you find it, then you just find the matching here in polynomial time. So this is super cheap, and you just connect it to your tree. Yes? So then it, it runs much faster, uh, but the problem is you have to get this uh, partition somehow. Yes? Uh, so what we do, we just get a random partition. Yes? Uh, in, 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 a way, in, in some way, we, we can generate random partition, and of course, the probability that you get the correct partition is inverse exponential in k. But like, if you repeat it inverse many times uh, and you multiply it by the time of finding trees here, then it turns out that overall you it's, it pays, pays off. Yes, and you get this 3.455 instead of this. Yeah, so 
this improves over state of the art uh, for both exponential time, exponential space, and polynomial space algorithms. And it's, we are still in polynomial space. And accidentally, when you check what it buys you for, uh, in the worst case, I mean, uh, when you parameterize by n, then it turns out that it breaks the 2 to the n barrier. Yes? Uh, so I don't know, maybe by some tricks Daniel showed us today, maybe you can do something better. But this is not a subset problem, so uh, not that directly, but yeah, maybe we should rethink it a little bit. Uh, yeah, I already told that the, the algorithms use polynomial space and uh, uh, they, they are actually randomized Monte Carlo algorithms, but the previous ones were also were, were randomized. All right, uh, so this was like first uh, branch of our results. Uh, the second branch uh, uh, is uh, we focus on some restricted graph classes. Yes, and this is, you can see it as a continuation of previous results already. Uh, also, so uh, uh, already in 2003, Epstein uh, noticed that Hamiltonian cycle can be uh, solved much faster uh, when your graph is cubic, so or subcubic. Uh, now these are the state of the art results. Uh, for maximum degree four graphs. There was some research, but uh, in polynomial space, the general algorithm of Bjorklund is, uh, now is, is the fastest, and it applies also for biggest uh, maximum degrees. Yes. So one kind of restricting your, your graph classes is your graph class is bundling the maximum degree. And another interesting direction is uh, this uh, result. So in the same, in the same paper, uh, Mm, you can you can see that in bipartite graphs, you get square root of two to the k algorithms. Uh, and uh, there is a natural question, I think: uh, what happens between bipartite graphs and uh, general graphs? Yes, and what is between? Uh, the answer is quite clear: these are decolorable graphs. Yes? So bipartite are two colorable, and what about three colorable, four colorable, and so on. Actually, instead of decolorable graphs, I would prefer to talk about colored graphs. Yes, because when somebody gives you three, well, if somebody gives you a two colorable graph, you can two color it easy. But if somebody gives you a three colorable graph, well, you don't know how to color it. So assume that you get a graph with a coloring. Yes. Uh, and then we saw this beautiful bound. Uh, when you put d equal two here, you get uh, square root of two, as before. Uh, uh, one nice thing about this is that there is Brooks theorem, which tells you that in graphs of maximum degree delta, uh, these graphs can be delta colorable, yes, unless they are like very special. Uh, so immediately this, this gives you this running time for uh, k path in maximum degree delta graphs. Yes, and this is these are. Uh, this is a table of numbers. Uh, so for k path, actually, uh, this improves the state of the art uh, for all, all of these deltas. Yes, and for the special case of Hamiltonian path or Hamiltonian cycle, already f for all deltas more bigger than three, this also improves the state of the art. And uh, this, these techniques also apply for this finding trees and internal spawning trees. Just the expressions uh, in, of the running time beco become so nice that I'm not sure whether they fit into the slide, so I decided to skip them. All right, uh, but actually, when we when we when we when we observed this uh, coloring thing, uh, we thought that maybe it is worthwhile to look at some other types of colorings. Yes, and it turns out that yes, that there, there is something interesting going on. So. Uh, I don't know whether you know this coloring, fractional coloring. So you have A colors and you assign B element subset to vertices. And you want the uh, subsets of adjacent uh, vertices to be disjoint. So this is an example that C5 is 5 over 2 colorable. Which makes sense, yes? Because uh, like if you use classical coloring, then saying that it is, this is not too colorable, yes? but 
saying that this is three color ability is a little bit too much because the third color you use only once. Yes? So we would like to say this is somewhere in between, between two and three. And the answer is maybe five, five halves. All right, so uh, the good news is, is you can also get some beautiful bond for, for, for these graphs. Uh, but the bond is maybe not that exciting, but I think the nice thing is that again, uh, it gives you some improved bond for some graph classes, namely, uh, like we have Brooks theorem for, for classical coloring. Uh, here also people bound this fractional chromatic number in some graph classes and their favorite graph class, I think, are triangle-free graphs of maximum degree three. There was a long sequence of results, and I think they solved some big conjecture recently. And uh, if you apply their, uh, their bonds, then you get such a running time for KL3 in this class. Maybe for, uh, for us, this class is a little bit too narrow. But actually, for, for the K path problem specifically, there is a nice trick which uh, allows you to kick out the triangles, namely when you have uh, you know, when you look for key path, when you're looking for key path in a subcubic graph, maximum degree three, whenever you have a triangle, you can replace, you can contract it to a vertex and put some, put uh, the weight of three, I think, on, on this vertex or something like this. And you can easily uh, show that uh, by this you reduce uh, finding paths into uh, in subcubic graphs into finding paths into triangle-free subcubic graphs, but you find weighted paths. But for us, this is not a trouble to introduce small weights. And immediate, so immediately we get this running time for maximum degree three. So we can improve uh, one row in the table somewhat automatically, yes, out of uh, known bounds on fractional chromatic numbers. And the last coloring we considered is vector coloring. Uh, and then do you think, we think this is also nice because this is like uh, a use of a tool which was used before in approximation and now suddenly it buys us something in, in, in FPT algorithms. So what is vector coloring? So here uh, are vector coloring. So now you assign unit vectors to vertices and uh, you want for every wedge, for every edge, uh, the dot product of the assigned vectors to be small, to be bounded by, by something like this. Uh, what's the intuition? The intuition is that, what, what is the dot product? This is cosine, roughly, right? So uh, from zero to pi, cosine is decreasing. So if you want to have small dot product, it means you want to have big angle. Yes, and it makes sense. I mean, in coloring, you want adjacent vertices to get something different. Yes, so it, it forces uh, it to, to be very different. Yeah. Uh, so so you, here you have an example uh, uh, which uh, optimally colors uh, C5. And this is nice because if you, if you like embed it uh, like in a classical pentagon, then you uh, get uh, Two pi over five uh, mm, angle, and uh, uh, if you embed it like like this pentagon, you get uh, twice bigger angles. Yes, uh, and it turns out that this this expression is uh, square root of five, and this is optimal. All right. So uh, what is nice about vector coloring? First thing is that uh, you have this chain of inequalities. So this is like relaxation of fractional coloring, which in turn is relaxation of uh, classical coloring, classical chromatic number. But uh, the distinctive property of this coloring is that uh, roughly you can find, you can find the, chromatic num the vector chromatic number in polynomial time, up to some small error, but for us it is irrelevant. Uh, so, uh, we can also get uh, some nice running time bound uh, for these R vector colored graphs. And we are pr very proud of it because we've got pi in our time complexity. Uh, but uh, you can notice that, uh, so, so it applies for R vector colorable graphs. Yes, suddenly I can write colorable, not colored because it runs in polynomial time, uh, the coloring. But if it works for our vector colorable graphs, then it also works for our colorable graphs, yes? Because 
because of this chain of inequalities. Yes. So uh, it means even if you, if I give you, even if you give me, and uh, like three colorable graph or four colorable graph without the coloring, still I can improve over state of the art uh, uh, running time bounds. Uh, I get something slightly worse than if you give me the coloring, but still something better than 1.66 to the k. All right. Uh, I don't know how much time I've got, but I hope still a few minutes. Yeah, a few. Uh, so, uh, and glimpse of I uh, at some part of our uh, method, uh, I decided to focus on this uh, coloring stuff because it's it's actually very easy. Yeah. So uh, you can look at the Bjorkum Kusper Kasikovisto algorithm for K path uh, as follows. Uh, you start from a partition of the vertex set into two sets, let's say V1 green and V2 red. And assume that you have a, I mean, and you want, you, you have a guarantee that uh, there is a solution K path such that the number of edges of this K path which go between the two sets, it is at least some T, okay? Assume that you've, you have something like this. Then some algebraic magic uh, is going on, which we don't want to look into because it takes much time and we don't have it. And then uh, the claim is that you get uh, this running time, 2 to the k minus t over 2. Yes? So you can treat this t as your saving over uh, 2 to the k time. So you want basically this t to be big. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so if you want to understand what we did, so of course for the result, on, uh, for the three problems, we had to make our hands dirty and open this black box and uh, uh, yeah, redesign it for trees. Uh, but actually for uh, the coloring part, uh, we don't touch this, we just define the uh, proper, the, the, the appropriate partition. and. Uh, uh, what do you do? Well, when you have decolored graph, a natural idea is to pick uh, half of the colors as your V1. Unfortunately, this uh, can fail. Yes, because it can happen that, let's say you have only one solution path and uh, it lives only in uh, this half of the colors that you have chosen. And then uh, you fail, you, you don't improve over 2 to the k even. Yes, but what you can do is you can, these constants, so you can actually, uh, test all the possible choices for the uh, for, for choice of the half of the colors and uh, by some not very hard uh, averaging argument you prove a bound and that's it uh, something very similar works for fractionally colored graphs uh, but for vector r colored graphs uh, the algorithm is particularly nice i think because what the algorithm does it just pick a random hyperplane through the origin and it divides the, the, the sp this unit sphere into two half spheres. Yes, let's call one of them red, red another green, and uh, all the vectors which are mapped to the green, uh, to the green half space, uh, their vertices uh, go to V1 and the other goes to go to V2. Yeah, and that's the that's the partition. And actually, if you think about it, what happens is if, is if you focus on one edge of your solution, then uh, uh, you have this R vector coloring, so it means that the angle between uh, vectors assigned to the endpoints is big, yes? So the probability that the endpoints uh, go to different half spheres is big. Yes, you have some lower bound. So from this, immediately you get a lower bound on the expectation on the... Uh, on the number of edges which go between the so I skipped the calculations, but they are pretty straightforward. Yes, and let me call, conclude with uh, possible further work. Uh, mm, 
So regarding the, the, the last uh, slide, so you can maybe uh, find some, some more interesting partitions which give some nice algorithms in some uh, other graph classes. Yeah, it's, it goes quite for free, yes, so you can try it. Uh, well, uh, another natural problem, uh, give a better algorithm when there are many leaves. Yes, so when there are few leaves, I mean, if you improve over our algorithm, then you maybe improve over k path. So uh, it's just more challenging. But it, I mean, the dependence on, 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 the, on the L can be also nicer. So yeah, something when, when there are many leaves, uh, improve over 2 to the k. Uh, well, uh, we are, <coughs> I mean, in, in this workshop, this question is particularly maybe worth uh, asking. I mean, we, 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 we get these upper bands uh, smaller and smaller, and the, qu the natural question is what's the lower band? Yes, can you, for k path, can you prove that it cannot, you cannot go below 101 to the k under, I don't know, SETH or set cover conjecture? That is, of course, a big open problem, but I'd like to mention it. And finally, I would like to mention max leaf problem. Yes, so actually, uh, Mm, this is the problem we started with. I mean, we wanted to solve this problem, we failed, but then we noticed that actually what we, uh, what we observed uh, can apply to a different problem. And <laughs> we turned like failure into a success. But uh, the original problem remains. Yes? So the original problem is uh, you want to find a spanning tree with at least k leaves now. Yes, so uh, there are some branching algorithms. I believe this is the state of the art result, 3.188 to the K. And uh, mm, I would be really happy to see uh, some fast uh, algorithm uh, based on these algebraic techniques, like, like the algorithm for k uh, I, I, It can be, I mean, you can do it using these techniques in 4 to the K, for example, but faster, no. So, yeah, that's what you said. Uh, when you run the vectors, you use the random hyperplane, even for coloring? Uh, what do you mean for coloring? You get from vectors to who is located in V1 and V2 and so on. <coughs> How do you run the vectors? What do you mean, run the vector? I mean, I just, uh, have I, have a ve I have vectors and they de define me the partition, yes? So, so that's what I'm asking. Did you use only the random hyperplane? Yes. I mean, maybe there is something smarter. Uh -huh. They use something as threshold color. Mm -hmm. Some other idea. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so maybe it. it uh, we, we, I mean, we haven't checked. Yeah, uh, it is worth trying, maybe. Yeah. Okay. In the, in the uh, vector coloring, you you use that approximation algorithm somehow. Uh, that for finding uh, the coloring. The oh. one plus epsilon approximation. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, you 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 want to f to find the coloring. I mean, you, you, you are given a graph without the coloring, and now this is this difference from the previous colorings that you can get the coloring uh, for free. Yeah. Right, is that, is that a, a, a PTAS or an EPTAS? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I guess... Uh, in other words, is epsilon in the, in the polynomial part, in the exponent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is uh, this changes the, the polynomial. In, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. What is that? Maybe yeah. maybe Gaino. This is a pitas. Uh, aha. Okay. So the the, ex, the exponent in the polynomial part uh, goes up when you want to be close to two hour bonds. Yes. So this is some uh, some maybe. So the question is, yeah, when we go below 1.66, what's the exponent? 